I'd like to take you back in time to the last senior Bible study we had. Uh, senior Bible study, as Dwight likes to portray them, are kind of raucous on occasions. And we're not opposed to calling each other names and don't get me wrong. It's all kept in good, clean Christian fun. But uh, everybody speaks their mind. Well, we were having a discussion uh, entitled Investing in Eternity. And we were exploring what, what eternity might be like. And so somebody asked this classic question that uh, I want to dwell on here for a moment. Well, what are we going to be doing for all eternity? Okay, what are we going to be doing? Now, let me give you an old paradigm for us and one that probably is still true for so many evangelical Christians. Well, that's real easy. When Jesus returns, we're going to have a thousand-year millennium, right? And we're going to be kings and priests, and we're going to rule on the earth and, and we're going to bring the whole world to Christ, and we're going to have a thousand years of peace and prosperity. Anybody resonate with that? Okay. All right, well then, once that's done, and once God is done working with the world, then what are we going to do for eternity? Well, let's see. We used to speculate that maybe we will go out to all these galaxies and universes and all this stuff out there that God has created, and we'll start this process all over again. Right? Something like that. Or some other such speculation that somebody would dream up as to what we were going to do for eternity. Now, I want to tell you an inherent flaw in this kind of reasoning that I believe keeps us out of a deeper relationship with God. That line of reasoning that I just followed is locked in to what we call time and space. Right? This whole question, what am I going to do, is locked in to time and space. It's a question that you and I ask. It's a question that we consider every day. What am I going to do? I even have an elaborate to-do list. It lists what I'm supposed to do today and what I'm not supposed to do as the case may be. Now, what I want to try to do is to raise your awareness with God that maybe some of the best possible moments with God are when you and I are not doing anything. Okay? Not doing anything. Now... This is really not that hard to comprehend, and I'm going to give you a few uh, uh, examples of where we get glimpses of this, but I would like you to go back to Genesis 1-1 with me. Genesis 1-1, you know the verse, probably one of the few in your scriptural vocabulary, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. All right, in other words, in the beginning, whenever this beginning was, God brought into being what we know as Time and space. That's what the heavens and the earth do. They give us time and space. We can calculate time. Hours and days and weeks and months and years. And, and it gives us space. In other words, things and building material and so on and so forth. And so we can do something. But let's remove all the time and space. And let's go back before there was time and space. And ask ourselves... What did God do? And now, is there an inherent problem in asking that question? If you're going to ask, what did God do? Because you see what we've done to God? We've locked him into time and space again. But God says he is, first and foremost, spirit. He's not material. He is not time and space. He is spirit. So if you're God and you're existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a Trinitarian relationship and you've been this way forever, what have you been doing? You, you see, I, I can't resist because we have to be doing something. But let me ask you something. Do you believe that God 
simply was overwhelmed and enjoyed his own company. Just the relationship and the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, let's try to take this down to human terms. Do human beings who are made in the image of God, and the way we're made in the image of God, if we went to Genesis 1, verse 27, it says that God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And if we're not careful again, we will imagine that in his image means legs and hands and a torso and eyes and ears and so on. And here we go again. We're just bound to determine we're going to drag God into time and space. But no, that's not what was in the image of God because God has none of that. Now, he can do condescension. He can come down and take on human form as he did in the person of Jesus. But that's not what he is in his natural state. He is spirit. So if we're made in his image, what is the only spiritual part there is to you? Your, your soul, your spirit in man, your mind, your thought processes, those things that are not bound in time and space. That is where the image of God is. That is where the connection with God must take place. Not in what we do, but in mind to mind. And it reminds me of the old Star Trek where Spock was going to do a mind meld. You know what I mean? And he, but you know, if you've ever seen any Star Trek where the mind meld. Well, at any rate, uh, uh, it's where in our mind to God mind... Even Jesus acknowledged we worship him in spirit that is determined by his truth of his word. But the worship is in spirit. And yet as human beings, we get all concerned about what the room looks like. What songs are we going to sing? What kind of chairs are we going to sit on? Is the lighting adequate? Is the temperature okay? Is the microphone working properly? Is the preacher interesting to listen to? <laughs> See? We get all concerned about these things, but it's just being with God in spirit, mind to mind, is what God is really after. Now, this is not so strange as you may think it is, because he has given us a couple of three glimpses of what this looks like in human flesh, okay? About just someone's presence being enough, because that's what we're looking for here, just someone's presence being enough. Okay, now, I want all of you, if you can do this, to go back to your teenage years and think of a crush that you may have had on somebody. You know, that male or that female that just, oh! Okay, something like that. Now, you know what you delighted in? If you had a crush on... I can think of two or three that I had in my formative years of junior high and high school. And you know what I wanted? I just simply wanted to be in their presence. We didn't have to say much. Didn't have to do anything. I just liked being around them. Okay? Just liked being in their presence. It wasn't the doing. It was the presence that counted. Right? Right? Okay, now, we even have glimpses of this in our marriage. I've kidded about this. The women are far more susceptible to this than men. Men, men would, this would pass them by. But we'll be at home, we'll be reading, and, and I remember Sandy said, well, just come be with me. And of course, the man's first question is, okay, I'll come be with you, but what are we going to do? No, we're not going to do much. We just, just sit here by me. What, what does she want? She wants my presence. She's not after me to do anything. But in my mind, I want to know what I'm going to do. And I think she has a better glimpse of eternity than I have because she can begin to see there is a beauty in presence that doesn't have anything. Well, what am I going to do? Okay? And, and you know, it, this, this is a, it's just a phenomena that, like I say, we can even see in human life we're just being together 
and having a presence with another individual is enough. Now, you may ask yourself, well, is this really a biblical concept? Oh, yes, it is. There's a scripture that is one of my favorite from the book of Psalms that I probably read hundreds of times. And it wasn't until this concept of I can only imagine that I began to see this psalm for what it really says. Let's go to Psalm chapter 16 and verse 11. Psalm 16, 11. And it's written by David. You know, David was a lot of things. He was a king and he was a great warrior and he committed sins and so on and so forth. But God said something about David. David was a man of heart. He was a man after God's own heart. He understood what it meant to be in the presence of God and that is enough. Look at Psalm 16, 11. You will show me the way of life. And he's done that for all of us that have been called into the Christian faith. All right? Granting me, notice now, the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. No mention of what we're going to do. Notice. The joy of your presence. Now, how many of you have heard of a doctrine? The Catholics uh, made this more famous than Protestants, but the Protestants have a take on it too, of the beatific vision. Anybody want to give me a simple uh, explanation of the beatific vision? Well, it's where you're going to be in heaven with God and being in God's presence is enough. It is so overwhelming, so breathtaking, so inspiring that just being in the presence of God is enough. Now, I got to tell you something. I can't compute because I will say, okay, well, we can go be in God's presence, but but I'm, I'm going to get bored after a while. <laughs> Time and space thinking again. What are we going to do? Time and space thinking again. See, we're, we're talking now. That's why I really began to appreciate the lyrics to the song, I Can Only Imagine. Let me give you the closing words. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. Did you catch those lyrics in the song? I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. What's that going to be like? What is there about God's presence that is so overwhelming that is so majestic, that is so awe-inspiring, that simply to be in his presence and to worship him is enough. Okay, now let's go back to Revelation chapter 4. I want to show you something here that maybe you have not thought about in this context before, but we, we're going to ponder it and consider it here a little bit. You know, the Apostle John had some visions of heavenly things, and he was able to describe them. And so in Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 6, he's going to explain in human terms the best he can with what God enabled him to see what it was like to be in the presence of God. All right. So verse 6. It says, in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. Now, this is hard to comprehend, and please don't ask me to draw you a picture of this. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. 
Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. All right, so what did these angelic beings do? Okay, they must serve some purpose. Well, it's going to tell us what they do. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was and who is and who is still to come. Really? Now, going back once again to the, to the lyrics of the song, I can only imagine. He, he, he talks about this. In the chorus of the song, he says, Surrounded by your glory. So here's a little bit of the glory we've just read about. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I don't know. But the implication is, it is going to be so inspiring and so filled with awe and wonder that it is enough. It is enough. Now, going back to where we were in Revelation 4, let's, let's find some other beings here. And it says that, um, we, we talked about the living beings, and down to verse 9. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, there were 24 elders who also fall down, and they worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Or as another version puts it, they were created for your pleasure. But you see, when God receives pleasure from our worship, I have a feeling that what we feel and what we experience is something that I can only imagine now because I only get little glimpses of it from time to time. Just little glimpses. Every now and then I am overwhelmed with a sense of his presence. And I, I, I like to bottle it. You know what I mean? So when I'm kind of down and discouraged, I can go in the shelf and I can get the bottle and I can screw the lid off and I can take a, oh yes, God, your presence is so good. And I can put the lid back on and set it up on the shelf until the next time I need a fix. But it doesn't quite work that way, does it? But here are these eternal beings, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and they don't have a problem at all for being called to a life of worship, to be in the presence of God and to worship Him. Not a problem for them at all. Now let's go to yet another scripture to get a little more of a glimpse of this. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, one of the letters that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And let's pick it up in chapter 12. And Paul was going to talk about a vision he had. And uh, this vision is kind of instructive. So let's pick it up in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 12. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. You know, you've heard about somebody having an out-of-body experience. Well, the Apostle Paul apparently had this vision, and, and I mean, it was one overwhelming vision. So what did it entail? Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body, but I do know that I was caught up to paradise, and uh, I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words 
things no human is allowed to tell. Now, let me speculate here for a moment. Is it because the Apostle Paul was forbidden to say anything about what he saw? Or what the Apostle Paul said, he couldn't possibly describe in words. It was that overwhelming. You know, I often uh, wondered where the Apostle Paul got the courage that he got to do what he did. I mean, this man put the Energizer Bunny to shame. I mean, you could nearly drown him, beat him half to death, whip him, take all the flesh off his back with, you know, cat of nine tails and stripes. You could imprison him, throw him in the lowest dungeon, starve him half to death, intimidate him, threaten him, and it didn't matter. He just kept coming back for more. And you know, one of the reasons I think he kept coming back for more is he knew that what we're living right now doesn't matter because I got a glimpse of the glory of God and that is so overwhelming. I'll go through anything now if I can have that for eternity. And so he just kept right on going right down to the time if, you know, tradition holds true that they beheaded him in Rome. And that was that. But he had this vision, and he just said, words cannot describe what I saw. I cannot express it. I can only tell you it is beyond your wildest dreams or beliefs. And you know, I, I think about things like that, and I think how much I allow myself to be bogged down into matters of time and space. And how little time that I really devote to real worship of God. And I don't mean to imply that what you do in your everyday life is not beautiful to God. Because I am coming to see more and more and more that God loves you not for what you ever do or say. God just simply loves you because you are. You're a being created in his image that he wants to share eternity with, and he just loves you because you are. Just little old you. See, just little old you and me. But we are beautiful to God as all his children are. So let's go to one more place here. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 13. You automatically think about it as the love chapter, and we're not going to go there. But there are some verses at the end that, that we certainly do want to dwell on. This is in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's pick it up in verse 9, and I think we'll kind of express the boat we find ourselves in right now. Now, our knowledge, he says, is partial, and it is incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy, in other words, things that God has revealed, they only reveal a part of the whole picture. We, we just deal in little bits and snatches. And because, you know, again, we're, we're tied to time and space. We're, we're tied to five senses. We're tied to human emotions. We're tied to faults and problems and sins that always seem to want to beset us. And so we, we just... Uh, we're just tied down, partial and incomplete. But verse 10, but when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. In other words, all of the mundane things that we deal with, all of the problems we have, all of our aches and pains, all of the things we worry about, the messes our kids or our grandkids get themselves into, you know, friends who are dying. Uh, going down a little further, verse 11. When I was a child, he says, I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child because that's what you do. You're a child. But when I grew up, I put away the childish things, decided that there was more. 
And, and I, I think there's kind of an echo to me here. You think of a little child playing in a sandbox and then gets a little older and then he becomes a teenager and he wants to drive a car and he's all twitterpated with the opposite sex and then he gets a little older and he goes off to college and maybe gets a job and then maybe he gets married and have a family and you progress through this and then the kids leave and the grandkids come along and then you start to get old and bald and gray and the wrinkles form and the age spots form and you start, you know, getting a little hitch in your gait and the old hips, you know, start to moan a little and then the arthritis begins to be your company and 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 you know the aging process continues and, and you look back and you say there, there's got to be something ahead see because it becomes more and more obvious with you with every passing day this ain't going on forever see that we're, we're in a one-way progression here that if you only look at it from the perspective of time and space this is not going to end well it is going to end. <laughs> that is for sure. And you begin to, I think, contemplate more about heavenly things. And like Paul said, all them physical problems and all those trials we've been through and all the time I spent in jail, that's, that's child's play. No, we're, we're concentrating now on, on what is ahead. And he, 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 he kind of wraps it up in, in verse um, 12. When he said, now we see things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror or a mirror that's been steamed over. Like when you're in the bathroom and somebody's using the shower and the steam comes out, clouds up the mirror. You have to keep wiping it off to try to see your image in it. And a cloudy mirror. But then we're going to see everything with perfect clarity. But we're not going to see everything with perfect clarity using body parts. We're going to see everything with perfect clarity, spirit to spirit, mind to mind. That's how we're going to see things with perfect clarity. Because all that I know now is partial and is incomplete. But then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Well, I think God probably knows me pretty well. You know, even the hairs on your head are numbered and so on and so forth. But... What about me knowing him? You mean I'm going to get a far better glimpse of his glory than I've got now? You mean God is going to impart things about himself that I can't even imagine now, that I don't have the capacity to take in now, that words couldn't even put it, you know? Yes, I think that's right. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, half afraid, curious, you know, uh, <laughs> I was going to say something crude like I might wet my pants, but you know what I'm saying? I'm still curious. I want to go. You know, I, I, I am like Bart Millard. I, I, I can only imagine. But boy, I like to try to imagine because this is probably going to be good. Far past what I could imagine, but I, 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 I really think it's going to be good. I really think it's worth whatever I have to put up with now because the present, you know, struggles of this life, it, it just doesn't matter. And that's the kind of faith that I want to carry me through. That's what I want to have in my mind when things get down and circumstances don't turn out too good and you're sick or infirmed or whatever it may be. And, and I, I want to focus on that, that this body is just running out of time. And it's the mind, it's the spirit, it's the heart, it's the personality, it's you that God is after for eternity not whatever flesh you may be clothed in at the moment. And so I just reflect on these things as we have in this sermon because to me it's just a, a, a wonderful thing. And I, I know going back to the song that we saw for our sermonic selection, uh, it, it's just a, a concept I can only imagine and it, uh, it certainly ministers uh, to me. Let's pray. Gracious God, we want to thank you so much again for all the things you do for us. But there again, Lord, we're locked into time and space and we're always looking for you like an errand boy to do something. We, we need things done, Lord. And the quicker you do them, the, the better off we all will be, seems to be our attitude all too often. But I think what you want us to do is just to, to, to call out to us and say, no, let's don't do anything. Just come over here and, and, and let's sit down. And let's just be with each other. 
Like that wonderful example that you gave in Revelation 3 when Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And if you let me in, well, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll break bread together. We'll have a meal together. We'll talk. We'll share our lives. And we'll, we'll enjoy each other's presence. And that's what we'll do. We'll enjoy each other's presence. And as David caught a glimpse of your glory and said, because in your presence is fullness of joy, it cannot get any better than being in your presence. There is nothing on heaven and earth that is better than your presence. So Father in heaven above, help us to see that vision. Help us to embrace it when times are tough and things don't go so well for us here on planet earth. And help us just yearn for the day when we can come and join the heavenly throng, and all of us can enjoy your presence forever and forever. And to that we all say, Amen.